Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us at today's results presentation. We've posted a strong set of results for the first half of the year, with income up 10% on a normalized constant currency basis, supported by continued positive momentum in the second quarter, which was up 11%, and generating a 10.1% return on tangible equity. We're also announcing today a new share buyback of $500 million to start imminently, as we actively manage our capital with the aim of returning in the region of $5 billion to shareholders over the next three years. We've achieved all this by actively supporting our clients and communities in what continue to be challenging conditions. The external environment is likely to remain difficult to predict in light of the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, the continuing impacts of COVID-19 and widespread supply chain disruptions. Recession risks are rising in the US and Europe as central banks are compelled to raise interest rates to address rapid and sizable increases in inflation. However, in the East, many of the markets in which we operate are showing early stages of a post-pandemic recovery. China is deploying strong policy stimulus that should kickstart the economy, boosting domestic and regional activity. We are well equipped to navigate this complex macroeconomic picture with the solid risk management foundations that the group has built over time and the resilience of our diversified business model. So with this backdrop, we remain confident in achieving the financial and strategic targets laid out back in February to deliver at least a 10% return on tangible equity by 2024 or earlier if the rates and operational stars align. I'll come back and provide a more detailed update on the encouraging progress we're making against the five strategic actions that we set out, as well as our strategic priorities, after Andy has talked us through our first half results. We will both then be available for Q&A as usual. Andy, over to you. Thank you, Bill, and good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I'll start with the first half highlights before providing more colour on what has been a strong financial performance for the first six months of the year. First half operating income of $8.1 billion excluding DVA was up 10% on a constant currency basis and after normalising for the 2021 IFRS 9 interest income adjustment. This growth was largely driven by a 12% increase in net interest income and a record half for financial markets, partially offset by a more subdued wealth management performance. Expenses were up 6% at constant currency and excluding higher performance rated pay accruals, with cost efficiency savings more than offsetting increased investment spend. This resulted in 2% positive income to cost chores for the first half. Credit impairment for the first six months of the year was $267 million. This compares to a net release of $47 million for the same period last year. The resultant underlying operating profit for the half year was therefore $2.8 billion, up 7% when compared to last year on a constant currency basis. All this led to a return on tangible equity of 10.1%. Loans and advances were down 1% in the second quarter on a headline level, but when you adjust for currency translation, and excluding the impact of RWA optimization actions, there was underlying growth of 2%. Risk-weighted assets reduced by a further $6 billion in the second quarter to $255 billion, driven mainly by currency translation and further optimization actions. And our CT1 ratio was 13.9%, which remains towards the top of our 13 to 14% target range. And as Bill said, we have just announced a new $500 million share buyback, leaving us with a strong capital position to fund future business growth and have capacity for more shareholder returns over time. Looking at income now in more detail. Income overall was up 9%, excluding DVA and on a constant currency basis, and was up 10% after normalising for the IFRS 9 interest income adjustment in the second quarter of 2021. Income growth was driven by a record half in financial markets, up 18% excluding DVA, with a strong performance in macro trading, which benefited from high levels of volatility, increased client flows, and elevated commodity prices. FM income also included a 212 million mark-to-market gain on liabilities driven by the current market volatility. Some of this gain may well reverse out over the coming quarters if conditions stabilise and spreads narrow. Transaction banking income was up 14%, reflecting encouraging signs of economic recovery across a number of our markets, with the cash management business benefiting from the rising rate environment up 25%. 
Retail product income was up 11%, with deposit margins improving as interest rate rises started to flow through, particularly in the second quarter, driving a 37% increase in deposit and other income. Treasury and other income was up 39%, mainly from the structural hedges we put in place earlier in the year and the benefit from rising rates. Lending and portfolio management was down 20%, impacted by the execution of the RWA optimization initiatives in the CCIB segment, mainly in the first quarter. And lastly, wealth management was down 16%. Two main factors at play here. Firstly, the extensive COVID-19 measures that were in place across Hong Kong, China and Taiwan for much of the first half reduced customer and sales activity. Secondly, investor sentiment remained very weak, negatively affecting market-sensitive products. Whilst income growth in the first quarter was driven by FM, in the second quarter we saw a more balanced picture with transaction banking and retail products growing strongly, helping to drive the second quarter income growth rate up to 11%. Looking at our top 10 markets, which account for around 80% of the group's income, most showed good income growth, with only two markets, Hong Kong and Taiwan, down year on year, both negatively impacted by COVID and weaker market sentiment. Looking at the early trading numbers for July, in financial markets, we continue to see similar levels of client flow to those we experienced in the second quarter, as well as ongoing elevated volatility. In wealth management, we are starting to see signs of recovery in Hong Kong. However, we remain cautious given the challenging market conditions, particularly with varying degrees of COVID lockdowns continuing across China. Let me now provide a little more colour on the 45% of our income that is interest rate dependent. Statutory net interest income was up 13% or around $400 million on a constant currency basis on the first half of 2021. This was driven by two things, a 5% underlying growth in interest earning assets after adjusting for FX and the impact of RWA optimization actions, which was particularly encouraging to see given the varying economic conditions being faced by our clients across our markets. And it was also driven by 11% increase in the normalised NIM compared with the same period last year, driven by higher interest rates. We are already seeing transmission of interest rate increases into our US dollar book. Casa deposit beaters have so far been lower than expected, and we have seen some early signs of migration from Casa into time deposits. With the margin having bottomed out in the third quarter last year, we have now had three quarters of sequential increases, with the second quarter margin of 1.35%, increasing by a further six basis points compared to the first quarter. This quarter-on-quarter -quarter increase in the NIM reflects a 10 basis point expansion from rising rates, partially offset by three basis points contraction from changes in product mix and a further one basis point from treasury hedging activity. This is a picture we expect to see over the next couple of quarters, rising interest rates driving NIM expansion with some increased dampening effect from our hedging activity, mix changes and increasing deposit beaters as we go through the cycle. Whilst dampening our short-term rate sensitivity, our structural hedge will protect our NIM as and when rates fall, and given the relatively modest size of our overall hedging program, rising rates remain a material tailwind for the group. And finally, on net interest income, we have updated our interest rate sensitivities to reflect the impact of further rate rises, since we've now experienced the first 150 basis points or so of increases. The positive impact from the next 100 basis points of rate rise is now $750 million in the first year, rising thereafter as fixed duration exposures subsequently reprice. This reduction in sensitivity is due to the impact in Hong Kong of the migration of mortgages to the prime rate cap and some of the rate rise benefit already being captured by Treasury hedges. In summary, as we previously guided, we expect the NIM to continue to gradually increase through the remainder of 2022 with the full year average NIM likely to be around 140 basis points. Turning to the other 55% of our group income, fees and other income, which was up 7% at constant currency, excluding DVA. This has two component parts, which moved in opposite directions. Net trading and other income was up 21%, excluding DVA, 
driven by a record financial markets trading performance. Net fees and commissions were down 9% year on year due largely to the softer performance in wealth management, which I covered earlier. Moving on to how our client segments performed, I'll keep this reasonably high level. CCIB income, which accounts for broadly 60% of group income, was up 16% on a constant currency basis, benefiting from the record financial markets performance, asset growth, and the positive impact of rising rates on transaction banking cash. CPBB income was broadly flat, reflecting a continuingly subdued wealth management performance, but a nice pickup in retail products in Q2, with deposit income being particularly strong. We continue to invest in the venture segment with expenses up 26% as we look to develop interconnected ecosystems across multiple markets. We have included three slides in the appendix of the supporting slide pack available on our website with further details on the various ventures. Now turning to our geographic regions where we saw good all-round growth. Our largest region, Asia, delivered a resilient performance with income up 4% on a constant currency basis and a return on tangible equity of 12%. Whilst our largest market, Hong Kong, was, understandably given the COVID challenges, down 5%, eight of the 10 largest markets in the region delivered income growth, and five of those grew at double digit. We even experienced growth in China in Q2, despite the lockdowns. In the Africa and Middle East region, income was up 8% on a constant currency basis. We saw some very strong market performances with the UAE, Pakistan and South Africa, all producing strong double-digit growth. The region's profits increased by 28% to $0.6 billion. We did say that we would move our AME exit markets into restructuring. However, to keep the comparative analysis as clean as possible, we have decided to leave them as is for this set of results. The markets will be reported in restructuring when we are further advanced in the disposal process. And finally, in Europe and Americas, we saw very strong income growth, up 48%, driven by the strong financial markets performance and the region's operating profits more than double. Europe and Americas is also a key origination center with its offshore network income up 10%. Bill will be talking more about the value of our network later. Looking briefly at our top five markets, Hong Kong's income was down 5% in the first half, impacted by the resurgence of COVID-19 in the first quarter and generally weak market sentiment. The second quarter was, however, stronger off the back of higher interest rates and some recovery in business momentum. The Singapore economy has rebounded as the country continues to reopen post-COVID. Our business has performed well, with income up 10%, with financial markets, cash and deposits being notably bright spots. Profits were up by 7% and returns up by one percentage point. It's a similar story in India, with a healthy post-COVID recovery reflected in good economic growth. Income in India was up strongly, with 14% growth for the first six months of the year, driving profit up by 9%. The Korean economy has navigated the pandemic well, maintaining low single-digit GDP growth, and our career franchise continues to go from strength to strength. Income was up 14% and expenses were down 3%, reflecting the restructuring action we took last year. This helped drive a 27% increase in operating profits and a mid-teens roti. Our China business grew income 6% year-on-year to produce its best-ever first-half income result. This was driven mainly by CCIB, more than offsetting a weak wealth management performance as a result of the ongoing COVID containment measures. Lastly, our four optimization markets continued to deliver strong bottom line growth, with operating profits up in aggregate 24% at three quarters of a billion dollars. Just seven years ago, they lost more than a billion dollars. Now, turning to expenses, total operating expenses were $5.3 billion for the first six months of the year, up 6% at constant currency, and after normalizing for relatively higher accruals this year, reflecting our currently improved trading outlook. Investment-related spend was up $100 million, including a $39 million increase in our ventures segment. This was more than offset by the delivery of around $200 million of expense efficiency savings in the first six months of the year, including the closure of an additional 31 branches in CPBB. 
Looking now at credit impairment. Charges for the first half total $267 million. This compares to a net release of $47 million for the same period last year. This represents a loan loss rate of 15 basis points, still low, but starting to move gradually towards the medium term range of 30 to 35 basis points. There were three major items driving this charge, mostly arising in the first quarter. $237 million on stage three assets relating to China commercial real estate exposures, $70 million relating to the sovereign downgrade of Sri Lanka, offset by a $129 million release from our management overlays. This included releasing $160 million from our COVID overlay, but increasing our overlay in relation to the China commercial real estate sector by $31 million to $126 million. We continue to monitor the situation very closely and remain alert to the challenges this sector is facing given the current external market conditions. Turning now to RWAs, which were down a net $16 billion or 6% in the first six months of the year, there were many moving parts. Starting with the $14 billion of increases, $6 billion from regulatory changes that were effective from the 1st of January this year, and $8 billion of asset growth and mix. This increase was offset by around $30 billion of RWA reductions, including $14 billion from efficiency actions primarily in the first quarter, positive credit migration of $6 billion, and an $8 billion favourable impact from FX movements. Lastly, looking at the capital position, we closed 2021 with a CT1 of 14.1% and are ending the first half at 13.9%, towards the top of our target range. Profit generation and the benefit of reduced RWAs added a combined 150 basis points to the CT1 ratio during the first half. This has been offset by a number of items, primarily 100 basis points from regulatory changes and the $750 million share buyback, in addition to 50 basis points from instruments fair valued through other comprehensive income on the Treasury portfolio. And finally, looking ahead for the rest of this year, as I mentioned in my opening comments, our financial performance in the first six months of the year has been very strong. And as Bill said, we are making encouraging early progress against the strategic priorities that we highlighted in February. However, external conditions remain difficult to predict, particularly in the West. Taking account of our current performance and the external environment, we have updated our guidance. We now expect 2022 income growth, excluding DBA, of around 10% on a constant currency basis, significantly ahead of our earlier expectations for the year. We have also updated the currency translation impact which we're currently forecasting to be around a $0.4 billion headwind. As previously guided, we expect further NIM progression in the second half of the year, taking the outlook for the full year average to be around 140 basis points and around 160 basis points for 2023. We now expect operating expenses, excluding the UK bank levy, of around $10.6 billion for 2022. This is net of around $0.3 billion of foreign exchange translation benefits based on the current outlook for exchange rates, but it does include increased performance-related pay. As a result, we now expect the currency translation impact to be a net drag of around $100 million to pre-provision operating profit as a result of the scale of the dollar strengthening across multiple currencies impacting our income more than our expenses. We're also adjusting our risk-weighted asset growth expectations for the impact of currency translation and now expect it to be broadly similar to 2021 on a constant currency basis. As previously guided, credit impairment is expected to normalise over time towards the medium-term loan loss rate of 30 to 35 basis points. And we fully intend to operate dynamically within the 13 to 14% range, taking account of business opportunities and the macro outlook. We remain fully focused and confident in delivering on our 10% ROTI target by 2024, if not earlier, dependent on interest rates and the broader operating environment. So with that, I will hand back to Bill to update on our strategic progress. Thank you, Andy. Back in February, we highlighted five strategic actions to help us achieve our 2024 targets. Since then, geopolitical and macroeconomic volatility has adversely impacted the global economy. 
It appears at this stage that the Asian markets have been less affected than those in the West. And as Andy mentioned, several are rebounding well from the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you can see, this is coming through in our results. Against this backdrop, our strategic actions remain highly appropriate and serve as catalysts for the whole organization. I'm extremely pleased with the progress we've made since we set out these commitments. I've already talked about our latest action on shareholder returns, and I will now run through the other strategic actions. Firstly, in CCIB, we're going to drive improved returns targeting an improvement in income return on risk-weighted assets by 160 basis points. In the first six months of the year, income return on risk-weighted assets was 6%, already a 110 basis point improvement from 2021. And that was driven by strong growth in income from financial institution clients, up 11%, which now accounts for 44% of CCIB income. In addition, the CCIB team successfully delivered around a third of their $22 billion three-year RWA optimization target in the first half of this year, enabling the business to remain well under their RWA target for 2024. In CPBB, the team has made steady early progress on their journey to transform profitability, with a cost-income ratio down two percentage points since the end of last year to 72%. Of their $500 million three-year gross expenses savings target, they have delivered $98 million of that so far, including a further 31 branch closers, and are executing plans to deliver the remainder of this year's target of $200 million. The business also continues to add a very healthy number of new clients through partners, with over 350,000 partnership clients added so far this year, a key contributor in driving growth in the number of mass retail clients. As we go into the second half of 2022, CPBB should see tailwinds for both interest rates and hopefully an improving wealth management outlook, which will help improve the cost income ratio further. China presents the group with one of the biggest strategic opportunities over the coming years. And as Andy mentioned, China this year delivered its best ever first half income performance. Our CCIB business made good progress in the first half of the year, and China network income grew strongly along a number of key corridors in ASEAN, of 36%, and South Asia, of 24%. We saw strong growth particularly in Singapore, India, and Bangladesh. In addition, there was strong growth in both sustainable finance income and income from new economy clients. Unsurprisingly, our CPBB business in China has faced headwinds with large-scale COVID lockdowns and weaker market sentiment impacting wealth management. Despite this, we continue to make great progress with our focus on digital partnerships with the launch of a number of new partnerships in the first six months of this year, including JD.com and WeBank. The long-term prospects from the structural shifts relating to China opening its financial and capital markets remain intact. We believe we are in a unique position to capitalize on the significant opportunities from this opening and are investing $50 million this year in both onshore and offshore capabilities as part of the overall $300 million three-year investment plan to further strengthen our position. Expense efficiency is core to enabling us to create positive operating leverage whilst creating capacity for us to continue investing into strategic initiatives. And here, as Andy mentioned, we have already delivered around $200 million of the $1.3 billion gross structural cost savings target. Moving on to our strategic priorities and network. At the start of 2021, we also set out four strategic priorities continue to grow our network business, continue to grow our affluent business, return to growth in mass retail, and advance on all fronts of our sustainability agenda. We're making good progress in every area. Given the changing economic environment, I'd like to drill down a bit on our network business. The group's unique and differentiated network continues to be a source of competitive advantage through which we facilitate investment, trade, and capital flows for our clients. Network income, that is income booked outside a client's headquarters country, is around 55% of CCIB income and is up strongly so far this year, with 14% year-on-year growth, with all our main trade corridors showing good growth. Network income is highly attractive for us. It produces higher returns for the group with an income return on risk-weighted assets of 7.2%, 120 basis points higher than the CCIB average. Asia is the largest originator of network income with $1.1 billion of income for the first six months of the year, which is up 14%. Intra-Asia corridors account for around three quarters of this. With growth of 10%, China is the largest single network market. Europe and America's network income of $1 billion was up 10%, with more than half of that into Asia, with particularly strong growth in the ASEAN and South Asia corridors, up 22%.
Lastly, Africa and Middle East generates about $0.3 billion of network income for the group and is also an important corridor for Europe and Americas and Asia. And whilst the overall network picture is a positive for the group, we are also taking action as we sharpen our focus on the most significant opportunities for growth while simplifying our business. To that end, back in April, we announced that we are exiting the onshore operations in seven markets in the Africa and Middle East region and focusing solely on the CCIB segment in two additional markets. We will look to refocus resources into new markets like Saudi Arabia and Egypt, as well as ongoing investments into several of our larger markets in Sub-Saharan Africa, building on the strong corporate, retail, and digital banking operations we have in those markets. Now turning to sustainability. We continue to see strong income momentum in our sustainable finance business, with income up 43% and asset growth of 11% year on year. Our pipeline continues to build, and we remain confident in delivering our $1 billion income ambition in the medium term. The Russian-Ukraine war is creating some negative sentiments for sustainable finance, as companies and countries are having to switch supplies just to keep the lights on. Volatility and higher prices and core commodities will also impact supply chain issues at renewable companies. However, this is likely to accelerate the climate transition in the medium term, with energy independence now becoming a security issue. I'm very excited by the appointment of Marisa Drew as our Chief Sustainability Officer. Marisa is a highly experienced CSO, and she will lead the newly created CSO organization across sustainability strategy, client solutions, and our Net Zero program. We continue to implement our ambitious Net Zero pathway, including those enhancements we announced in March. We're also continuing to demonstrate our thought leadership with the release of our Just-in-Time report that investigated the cost and socioeconomic implications of a net-zero carbon transition. We know that emerging markets are most in need of capital and require almost $95 trillion to affect their transition. The funding needed is significant, and reaching net-zero in our markets will therefore be no mean feat, and we remain optimistic in our ability to play a pivotal role in supporting this just and sustainable transition. Lastly, I want to drill down a bit into our venture segment. We built a diverse portfolio of 20-plus investments and over 30 ventures across six high-conviction themes, providing optionality for our future and a key catalyst for change in our broader organization. And we're making meaningful progress across a number of areas. We now have around 1.2 million customers across the various ventures, including over 350,000 customers in MOX, our Hong Kong virtual bank, up 100,000 in the second quarter alone. The total value of customer assets across the various platforms is now almost $2.5 billion, with transaction flows of around $8 billion in the first six months of this year. Our recently announced partnership with SBI Holdings will help us accelerate growth of Solve, the B2B digital marketplace for micro, small, and medium enterprises. We also have in the pipeline some exciting new ventures that are close to launch. Trust, our second separately licensed digital bank in Asia, in partnership with NTUC, is in extensive user testing and plans to go live in the next couple of months. Our plug-and-play banking-as-a-service solution, Nexus, now has regulatory approval for launch in Indonesia, which is planned imminently. And we're looking at expanding this to a second market. More to come on that later this year. So as you can see, since its creation, Ventures has come a long way with very promising future potential. So to sum up what Andy and I have just covered, we delivered a strong financial performance in the first half. We're making very encouraging early progress against the five strategic actions we laid out in February. And looking forward, whilst recession risks are rising in the West, we're seeing the early stages of a post-pandemic recovery in many of the markets in which we operate, underpinning our prospects for growth. We have the right strategy, business model, and ambition to deliver our 2024 targets. The management team and I remain focused on delivering these targets while we create exceptional long-term value for the group. So with that, I'll hand over to our operator so Andy and I can take your questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question via audio, please press star one and one on your telephone keypad and wait for your name to be announced. Alternatively, please use the question box available on your webcast page to submit your questions. Once again, star one and one if you would like to ask a question via the telephone. We will now take our first question. Please stand by. Your first question comes from Joseph Dickerson from Jeffries. Please go ahead, your line is open. Hi, good morning. Um, congrats on a uh, very good uh, set of results. 
Um, I, I just have a couple of quick questions on the margin. Um, one, in terms of the current uh, quarter, um, could you just discuss the headwind from Treasury effects? Because that was quite a tailwind um, last quarter. And then I was a little surprised you didn't push somewhat higher on the um, on the guide for this year, given we've got the one month and three month high bore up about 50 bits since the end of Q2. Is this is this partially explained by the um, uh, prime rate cap? Thanks. Andy, why don't you take that one? Okay, uh, Joseph, thanks very much for your uh, question. Um, so we've seen another pickup in the NIM um, in the second quarter compared with the first quarter. Um, we've reaffirmed that uh, the 140 number for the full year we think feels good. In fact, if anything, we've slightly upgraded that because I said previously um, approaching 140. Um, now probably semantics a little bit, but around 140. So we feel direction of travel there is good. Um, we have included in the slides uh, a sort of move of the NIM between first and second quarters. Um, and you can see in there that there's a basis point or so of compression from hedging, um, but there's underlying growth um, that uh, is moving strongly, uh, obviously, in a favourable direction. Um, for next year, we've said 160 still feels a good number for us, so uh, we've got the flow through of what's already happened and obviously some of our book reprices at periods of time, not immediately, but over a period. So I think direction of travel there is good. Um, the high bore prime essential effect in Hong Kong, we've factored into that. There are caps on some of the mortgages, so that does uh, provide a ceiling on some element of the book. But that is factored into those numbers. And uh, as I say, around 140 this year, 160 next year, I think that's the track we're on now. Back to the operator. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. We will now take our next question. Please stand by. Your next question comes from the line of Omar Keenan from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for taking um, the questions. Uh, I was hoping you could give us a bit of an update on the progress um, around the efficiency measures on the capital ratio, which, which have been very strong. Uh, just wondered if you could give us an update as to um, how much uh, optimization and efficiency might might still be um, yet to be delivered upon, and whether you know the total targets that were set out uh, could be um, exceeded. And um, just related to that, whether you could summarize sum, summarize the movements in RWAs going forward uh, towards the end of the year. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Omar. I'll, I'll take a uh, first stab. I'm, I'm sure Andy will uh, will add some color. Uh, bottom line, things are, are very much on track. So uh, first half, uh, 7 billion reduction in RWAs, uh, very much on track in terms of the improvement in the return on risk-weighted assets. That obviously has a, a number of moving pieces, but uh, as, as we break it down, uh, the, the business is, is demonstrating very, very strong discipline in terms of our management of, of risk-weighted assets uh, across the board, but in particular in the CCIB area, uh, and that's, that's coming through in the numbers. So, so well, uh, well on track to hit our $22 million uh, optimization target over the over the three-year period, and the return on risk-weighted assets has seen a big jump. Now, obviously, that's also uh, contributed to by the the strong income results. Uh, and as Andy mentioned, that that begins with uh, with very strong financial markets results in Q1, continued strong in, in Q2, but obviously off that that torrid pace from early in the year, but also strong income growth across the rest of the of the of the business, and uh, and that it was much more balanced in the second quarter, which of course is encouraging. Uh, when we look forward, we look at, we look at the, the deal pipelines, we look at the expectation for ongoing customer activity in financial markets uh, associated with what we expect to be an ongoing volatile environment, uh, and uh, we, we see the opportunity to continue to, uh, to drive both the RWA optimization but also the, uh, the associated income growth that uh, will improve that return on risk-weighted assets. But Andy? So the, the RWAs have moved around <coughs> a lot over the course of the year. So we've had regulatory changes, we've had the efficiency drive, we've had the asset growth, we've had the mix changes, et cetera, and the FX obviously has played into it as well. Um, what we've said is if you take the start of the year and adjust for FX, we'd expect to be roughly that sort of level at the end of the year. That would imply probably 3% growth in the second half of the year. That will be net of efficiency gain, so obviously assuming some client growth may be a little bit ahead of that, offset by some of the efficiency gains, and in that sort of zone is where we'd expect to be at the end of the year. Operator, can you take the next question, please? Thank you. 
Your next question comes from the line of Tom Rayner from Numis. So please go ahead. Your line is open. Yes, sir. Thanks. Good morning, um, everyone. <clears throat> um, two, two questions, please. Um, first on credit quality. Um, I see you've reiterated, I think, your medium term guidance on the ECL charge, but sort of got used to, I think, seeing very benign trends on, on sort of all the indicators as well. And I noticed the early alerts have sort of gone up now two quarters in a row. I just wondered if there's anything going on there that, that we should be uh, concerned about. And uh, just a second question on uh, um, the RWA optimization. I don't know if you want that now as well. Yeah, we'll, 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 why don't you go ahead, Dan? We'll, uh, we'll take them both and then. Yeah, just, I mean, uh, I know you've said that you're, you're comfortable with the 22 billion over three years. I mean, the you know the, the, the sort of quarterly progress this year. I think it was six billion in Q1, and then only one billion in Q2. I just wondered why that's stalled in the second quarter quite quite the way it has. Thanks. Good. Uh, I'll, I'll take a, a quick stab, and uh, again, I'm sure Andy will have color. Uh, the um, credit outlook is is. Pretty good, right? So the, the quality of the portfolio is strong. Uh, we've weathered some 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 storms. Uh, we continue to be very well provided, well covered in terms of our provisions, and we continue to have uh, small but but meaningful overlays both uh, around the, uh, the 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 tail end of the COVID pandemic. Let's let's hope it's the tail end, uh, and also around China real estate. Uh, the uh, uh, early alerts, I think, reflect the, the fact that the markets in which we operate are under stress and will will come under more stress, uh, and that stress obviously from uh, slow down in growth in the West, uh, so the stress from, from uh, higher cost of living, higher commodity prices, and now higher interest rates associated with a strong dollar. Uh, we've obviously seen that stress manifest in, in Sri Lanka in, in a very acute way. Uh, other markets in which we operate are under pressure as well. And I think we've taken a very prudent approach in terms of identifying the, uh, the, the potential problems that could come down the road, and that's, that's what the early alert portfolio is. Uh, but I would say against that backdrop, we've, we've weathered the call the early stages of this storm very well, and we have every reason to think that we'll continue to. Uh, but the guidance back to uh, what we would consider to be a more normal uh, through the cycle credit cost range uh, is, is the, the basis on which we're planning. It's the basis on which we plan for, uh, for the investments that we make and the returns that we expect to achieve. Uh, we think that's prudent, cautious, and, um, and we think that's stood us in pretty good stead so far. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Andy for any, any comments on, on either of the two questions, uh, but obviously particularly focusing on the RWA question. Yeah, okay. I mean, just to supplement that maybe on the credit, if you look not just at the early alerts, but the three that we have in our bucket, we are 11 billion or so. Um, we've been a little bit below that the last couple of quarters, just fractionally above it now. I wouldn't see anything significant in there. I mean, obviously, there is a little bit more pressure in some countries at the moment, and hence the slight increase, I think, is consistent with that. Our credit impairment charge going through the PL has been very low. We said over a period of time it will normalise. So I think it's all, it's all pretty consistent with that. So it's, it's a modest change at the, at the edges rather than anything more um, substantial. Um, in terms of the RWA efficiencies, they're not going to come in, in a purely linear way. Um, there are some of those that are relatively easier to do. There are some of those that will take a bit more time to actually work through. We remain completely committed to uh, getting the overall number out on a three-year basis. So I think on a quarter by quarter, you'd expect that number to move around a little bit, but nothing ominous there. Um, back to the operator. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. Guys. We will now take our next question. Please stand by. Your next question comes from the line of Fad Kumwa from Redburn. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, Buzz. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, just a couple. Um, the first one, just going back to NIM. Um, thanks for the 160-bit guide in 23. But I think 160 was kind of where you were pre-COVID when U.S. rates were kind of more like the low twos. We're looking at U.S. rates being kind of reasonably above 3%. Is there anything um, that's changed in the balance sheet structure that would mean that your um, margin shouldn't be materially higher than that, uh, given the U.S. rate environment? It doesn't look like the hedge is really a big enough offset. Um, so is there anything else going on in the balance sheet that would result in your NIM relative to where the U.S. rates are going being lower than where they were pre-COVID? Um, that's my first question. Uh, and my second question is just um, thanks for the comments on wealth seeing early signs of recovery. Uh, a couple of 
Um, wealth management peers in Asia Pac have been a bit more constructive, seeing Asian clients deleveraging and taking a bit more risk. So, what do you see on the outlook for wealth management given the kind of zero COVID policy in China? Would you are you also seeing signs of like more risk taking and better revenue momentum? Thanks. Good. Uh, thanks, Rod. Uh, Andy, why don't you take the NIM question and, and any comments you want on the wealth side? I can come back in on, on either. Yeah. Um, so you, you're quite right. The NIM immediately pre-COVID was about the 160 level. So uh, 2023 being back at that level will be very equivalent to where we were um, immediately um, pre-COVID. I think the balance sheet has moved a little bit in that period. You know, it'll be a total three-year um, period. So there is some product mix change. Um, obviously, in our forward forecast as well, you know, we are second guessing what we think will happen over a period of time. So overall, I don't think there's anything at all ominous in there. I think getting back to 160 is more putting ourselves back on a sort of long term average interest rate basis where you'd expect this business to be operating. And clearly, the profitability of the business will be you know, higher by quite a notch as a consequence of that. Um, wealth management side, look, you know, sentiment has been against investment just recently. Um, the first quarter in particular, to some extent the second quarter, there were lockdowns in our biggest wealth market, market of Hong Kong. That obviously doesn't help sort of face-to-face -face sales, etc. So our view is that over a period of time, particularly lockdowns now fading, sentiment will be what it will be. But typically after a period of sentiment off, things do rebound. Um, the question really is, when will that happen? I think we've taken a reasonably cautious view of that, but I'd hope at some point in time we would see actually the sentiment change coming. And remember, the wealth management business for us, over a multi-year period, the CAGA on our income there has been very, very strong, sort of 8 to 10% over a multi-year period. It has had periods when it's been lower, it's had periods when it's been higher, but overall our confidence in that business remains absolutely unchanged through this. It's just a tougher period just at this point in time. Yeah, I, I think I'd be even even more direct. I, when, when we look over you know, ten or fifteen years, uh, there, there's leading indicators, and then there's the outcome. The, the outcome is income, and the income is highly dependent on market sentiment in any given quarter. Uh, and whether it's the it's in, in this quarter, apart from the, the Hong Kong related and China related COVID lockdowns, which of course has a direct impact in terms of our ability to connect with customers. Uh, equity markets were very weak, in particular, uh, early in the, in the period, Chinese equity markets, uh, and the tech sector, which had been a, a, a higher proportion of, of our wealth management activity than, uh, than the, broader, uh, the broader market. Uh, so like earlier market disruptions that we've seen that come from time to time, uh, we have uh, had a, a meaningful drop in income uh, that typically stabilizes at a period. Perhaps we're in that stabilization period right now. Uh, and then we get a, a gradual return, uh, at, uh, generating this, this 8 to 10% uh, compound growth that Andy's talked about con consistently. The leading indicators uh, are very encouraging for us uh, in terms of new clients, uh, in terms of the, the uh, customer satisfaction that we get from those new clients, the amount of money that they're moving into their accounts. And we see that in, in, in terms of a good uh, CASA growth and time deposit growth uh, as customers are getting ready to invest with Standard Chartered. Uh, by moving their money into our accounts. It's a leading indicator because they're not yet putting that money to work in the, the riskier markets, which of course generate higher wealth management income for us. The other comment I would make is that uh, while the, the bank insurance uh, distribution has been very disrupted by the COVID-related lockdowns, the underlying performance there continues to be very strong as well. Uh, so uh, the, 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 we're, we're, we're happy, satisfied, I guess would be the better way to say it, with our current performance given the context, uh, but quite optimistic about the outlook in the wealth space. Can yeah, we go back to the operator? Um, and he's the oh. one follow up. Sorry, sorry, Pod. Sorry, Thank Pod. You. Carry on, Pod. Thank you. Okay. I well, Pod, go you've got to go back next. in the queue. <laughs> sorry. I will go to the next question. Please stand by. Your next question comes from the line of Robin Down from HSBC. Please go ahead. Your uh, line is open. Good, good morning. Um, just one one quick question for me. Um, well, obviously, we tend to focus on the kind of margin numbers, but uh, obviously the average interest in the asset figure is also kind of important um, for, for the guidance. If, if I look at your sort of average balance sheet data on page 170, it looks like you're running down into bank lending and also customer lending. I don't know if you can give us a kind of sense for um, what you're seeing in terms of, of customer loan demand at the moment. 
and where you might expect to see those average interest earning assets going in the second half and perhaps if you've got the crystal ball into kind of 2023. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, let me let me pick that up, Robin. So there's been, again, quite a lot of movement in the average interest earning assets over the course of the year. So we've had underlying growth from customer demand. We've had foreign exchange. Um, we have had the consequence of the RWA efficiency metrics. Um, you put all of that together, we probably had underlying um, about 2% growth um, in the six months year to date. So that, I think, is a sort of fair indicator of what's happening under the surface of it. Um, as we look forwards for the balance of year, I think we've got a number of factors in play here. Um, one is markets like Hong Kong, which clearly had a more difficult first half, hopefully picking up a little bit more momentum. Um, secondly, quite a lot of our markets are still in the coming out of COVID phase, um, which um, you know, I think still gives some opportunity for, um, for growth in that space. Um, FX will obviously play a role as we go forwards over the coming months. Um, but I think we are still sort of sitting here saying, actually, with the way that the economies in which we operate, remember those largely not the Western ones, um, playing out that actually there is reason to still be you know, quietly confident about the growth that's there. There's obviously a lot of talk about recession in the Western market. That's probably, you know, for us, a slightly lesser issue, certainly, as we talk about the balance of this year. Um, we'll all have to see where that goes next year. But at the moment, I'd say that the engine there is still running OK and um, we'll continue to push hard on that over the balance of this year. Operator, can we pick up the next question? Thank you. We will now take the next question. Please stand by. Your next question comes from the line of Alistair Ryan, Bank of America. Please go ahead, your line is open. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, two related questions then, please. I'll go back to the net interest margin guidance. If I, if I go to the year-end 2021 results, uh, you gave us $1.3 billion for 100 basis points, plus 30 to 40 percent um, over time. So given the 3 percent move in rates since then, um, that would mechanically, from the 1.19 start, give you a number of about 1.9. Um, now, I appreciate um, things change, um, but 1.6 to 1.9 is a really big gap. So the question, in short, is, is the 1.6 a low guidance, or is something really meaningfully different to what you thought at the beginning of the year? And the second question is on the current and savings accounts book, um, that's down 7%, slide 41, down 7% year to date, which is quite a meaningful reversal of what's been a very strong trend. Um, is there anything in that? Or just currencies. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, Alistair, let, let me pick the first point up. Um, I know we give it as our guidance, the sensitivity analysis, the 1.3, but it's an incredibly difficult number, I think, to work from. Um, you know, it is an assumption of simultaneous change in uh, FX rates across all markets at the same time. It is a full year effect, and obviously the big ramp up we've seen has been a mid year effect this year. Um, we have then got FX that comes into play, and we have got, as you observe in your question, the fact that after the first year, it is a first year number, we then get more um, assets, sort of rollovers, et cetera, and the repricing. So it is genuinely really difficult to do that sort of correlation. Um, I think that I would place personally more stall on what we've said on the 140 and the 160, because that takes account of difference in timing of rate changes across the many, many markets in which we operate. Um, it takes account of when during the current year, particularly, those rates started to move. It takes account of the very latest view that we've got on betas, et cetera. Um, so I would say that the 140, 160 is sort of the real life number, whereas the 1.3 number you know, is one on a particular um, set of, uh, of, of assumptions. Um, on the savings, um, listen, I think what we've seen in the first part of this year um, is a slight movement, not surprisingly, um, between our sort of current account savings account and the term deposits. Um, obviously, as rates increase, 
any sort of gap between what you can get on a current account and what you can get on a time deposit, more people will start to look at that. And I think by memory, the mix between the current accounts and the term deposits in our consumer business has changed by two percentage points, I think it is, on a year-to-date basis. And probably we'll see that continue over the balance of the year. Um, you know, time deposits are actually more expensive for us, but overall it's very good quality deposits. So I sort of look at the two as a collective, um, but I'm, I'm very happy with the overall liquidity position at the moment. It's uh, not, not at all troublesome. And maybe just at a, at a big picture level, uh, as we reflect on the guidance that we gave in the beginning of the year, we obviously made assumptions market by market about the, uh, the pass-through rates or the beta, deposit beta, and we made assumptions about the migration from, uh, from current accounts, savings accounts, into time deposits. Uh, and that was the basis of our $1.3 billion guidance. As we see how things have played out so far, it's basically perfectly in line with our guidance. So the market behaviors are exactly what we expected. We're obviously not done uh, with the rate hike cycle, uh, but, the, but the behaviors are the same, the, uh, or the, the behaviors are in line. The, uh, as you point, pointed out when you, when you asked the question, Alistair, the, uh, the FX impact on the, the, the current account and savings account and, in, in, and time deposit numbers is material. So when you normalize for, for the currency effect, or to take a constant currency view, it's more or less flat when, when we get to the savings accounts. So, um, so it is largely down to the FX. Uh, but the, the really important point is that overall, uh, we were guiding to, uh, to 160 basis points in NIM, and that's something that we we're very happy to, to stand by as we, as we sit here today. So, uh, operator, I think we can go to the next question. Thank you. I will take the next question for you now. Please stand by. Your next question comes from the line of Nick Lord from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for taking my questions. Uh, two questions, actually. The first is just uh, referring to slide 33, uh, which is your China commercial real estate um, uh, breakdown, uh, 3.7 billion. I just wonder if you could remind us in terms of um, sort of split about between state, the state-owned enterprises, between private enterprises. Um, and also the uh, um, stuff that's booked out of Hong Kong, um, is that sort of directly exposed on uh, sort of mainland China um, sort of property or, or is it sort of uh, Hong Kong exposures of mainland developers? And also just want to make sure that you sort of captured in there um, sort of any exposures outside of China of, of mainland developers. So I'm just trying to get a feel for what's in and what's not in that 3.7. And then the second question is, uh, you know, as HIBOR, uh, one month HIBOR starts to move up, which I assume it will do over the next few months uh, to sort of close some of the gap with one month LIBOR, uh, you're going to have to begin to sort of think about what you do with prime rates in terms of your mortgage spreads. So I just wonder if you could give us uh, sort of a view on what you might think uh, will happen to mortgage pricing in Hong Kong and, and what you've sort of incorporated in that margin forecast on uh, for, for mortgage pricing in Hong Kong. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Nick. So um, slide 33 that uh, you referred to, as you say, $3.7 billion of um, commercial real estate relating to China. That's slightly down on where we were previously. Um, we've given various data points on that slide. I mean, I, I would say overall we've been pretty thoughtful about which exposures we've taken on over a period of time. Generally speaking, we've been with the higher quality developers. Um, roughly, I think three quarters of that exposure is investment grade. A um, proportion of it that is projects under construction in China is, I think, less than 1%. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a well constructed portfolio. Not without its issues. You know, we have said that a big part of the uh, credit impairment charge we took in the, um, the first half, I mean, looked at one way, most of the group's charge overall um, did relate to um, the China commercial real estate um, area. Um, we also show a split on that chart of how much of the uh, exposure is booked in China, how much of it is booked in Hong Kong. And that depends a lot on where the clients are based, um, et cetera. Um, on high bore, we are clearly, as we always do, monitoring the position. Um, we want to grow the mortgage book there. We want to grow the business there. We want to make sure we're competitive on pricing. So 
we'll continue to monitor our pricing on that front and uh, we'll, we'll see how things develop over the coming quarters. Uh, we have made a set of assumptions on that incoming, obviously, to our NIM forecast for the group as a whole, which I referred to um, earlier on. That is embedded within that. Operator, I think. Next question. Okay. Thank you. We will now take our next question. Please stand by. Your next question comes from Pearlie Mong from KBW. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hello. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, just um, can, can I go back to the prime um, rate in Hong Kong? So, um, so what are the considerations when you think about moving the prime rate? Because um, historically, it's not um, a rate that moves too much. Um, so just wondering what are the considerations or put other way, are there any non-commercial reasons that you would have to consider um, in your sort of position to think about whether to move prime or not? And then how much of the deposit in Hong Kong are prime linked? So if prime goes up on the lending side, would some of the benefit be offset by a higher deposit rate over and above what you would expect from obviously um, interest rates going higher generally? Um, so that's the first one. Um, and then the second one, um, the NIM guidance for next year, 160. Um, so, I mean, there are already some noises from, from Fed uh, uh, last week that, uh, you know, uh, the rate of um, rate hikes might be slower next year, et cetera. So if we see that happening, um, would, would you still stand by the 160 or, or sort of just what sort of assumptions are in that number? Thank you. Can start on that, Andy? Uh, yeah, so let me let me see if I can have a go at that. Um, so prime rate, I mean, I think as with any rate setting, we will take a view as to what the market is doing. We'll take a view as to what you know customers are doing, and if we think it is appropriate, we will make change there. The prime rate has not historically changed very much at all. So uh, um, you know, don't, don't hold your breath, but uh, nonetheless, we'll keep it under review. Um, proportion of the deposits that are prime linked, I think by memory it's just over half or something of that order. Um, and then in terms of the NIM guidance, um, listen, we can only give a view based upon our sort of best uh, expectation of what may happen. Um, it may well be clearly that our estimates prove to be, you know, inaccurate, but uh, we think as a sort of uh, middle course, 160 is around where we will be. Um, the other factor clearly going into not the NIM necessary, but the NII is then just what does the recessionary talk uh, do? Is there an offset from some of the uh, NIM increase that we'll see at the moment? Recessionary talk more Western than Eastern, but you know, we'll see over a period of time whether that um, continues to be the case. But um, a, a reasonable estimate at the moment, I think, would be that that 160 um, area is where we should be in 2023. But maybe just to, to state the obvious, and I think it's implicit in your question, uh, the, the, if, if rates do move in such a way that it caused the, the, the banks in the market, including ourselves, to increase the prime rate, uh, there would be, that would be a partially hedged uh, outcome in terms of the, 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 uh, the prime rate of mortgages versus the prime uh, uh, linkage on the deposits. But net-net, it would probably be a modest negative. But that's, that expectation or probability is, is, is priced into the 160. Thank you. We will now take our next question. Please stand by. Your next question comes from the line of Aman Rakar from Barclays. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Andy. Um, one question on capital. Um, your C to one ratio is 13.9%. It's at the top end of your target range. Appreciate RWAs are going to drift higher in H2, but you're likely to be pretty capital generative, I'd imagine. Um, I'm just trying to work out why perhaps you didn't look to announce a bigger share buyback than the 500 million that you've announced in, in Q2, um, particularly given the last buyback you did, 750 million. I think you executed that well within the quarter, so I think it took you about two months. You're likely to execute this actually in fairly short order. Is there any reason why you've not announced something higher? And, and should we expect that perhaps you could announce another buyback with Q3 results? Or is this a half yearly thing? Thanks. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> Mark, thanks a lot for the question. We, uh, we said that we're going to operate dynamically within the range, and, and we are. 
Uh, we've also said that we want to uh, generate uh, enough excess capital to return in, in excess of $5 million to shareholders over a three-year period. And we're you know, at one point four or so billion as, as we sit here uh, today. We are very well on track to deliver that. So uh, it, it feels like we're, we're on, on the right track. We want to be well capitalized as we go into a period of uncertainty. Uh, we are. And we were very comfortable with, with, with our asset quality and our, and our provision level. Uh, we're comfortable with the earnings momentum that we've got. Uh, we want to have a strong capital position, and we do. We think that there will be opportunities both, uh, both internally uh, to invest, but obviously also, uh, also externally. And we want to be prepared for things that come along. So uh, we're operating dynamically in the range exactly as we said we would. We've got a good, healthy return to shareholders. And, uh, and 500 felt, felt like the, the right ground to hit at this point. But uh, I'll turn to Andy. I'm sure you've got some more thoughts on this. Well, probably not many more thoughts, actually. This is a balance. We want some uh, capability to grow the business further. We want to make sure we're protected on the downside if the recessionary concerns become any bigger. And our sense is at this point in time to be on a pro forma 13.7 feels fine. Uh, will we review it in future? Absolutely. Are we still committed to the five billion overall in the three years? Absolutely. Um, indeed, look at the buybacks plus the interim dividend we've declared today, 1.35 billion on its own. Um, the share price where it is today makes it pretty attractive to be doing the buybacks as well. So um, I, I think um, you know, it seems us a sensible place to be. And um, over a period of time, as we have done before, obviously we'll review it. But five billion over the three years remains the objective. Did you consider a additional buyback at Q3? We'll, we'll review. We'll review it on a regular basis. Um, you know, historic pattern has been more one. Uh, doing it at half years, but there is no absolute reason why that has to be the case. So we'll review it you know, at various points in time. If there's anything uh, more that we can do, you know, as we have shown, I think, do, do not worry. We're, we are very prepared to do buybacks. Can we take the next question? Thank you. We will now take the final phone question and please stand by. The question comes from the line of James Invine from Society Generali. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Um, I just had a one question on the rate sensitivity slide, slide 29 of the deck. Um, I mean, it's come down, the, the overall sensitivity has come down for the reasons you've laid out. Uh, but now we see that the other currency block um, is pretty much, I think, half of the overall sensitivity. So I was just wondering if there's any any more colour you can give us maybe on that block? Um, if there's you know, one or two oversized uh, currencies in there, uh, or, or perhaps just you know, the uh, geographic flavour of where that sensitivity is coming from. Thanks. Yeah, th thanks, James. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I think this slide is based upon a set of assumptions, but the real world will be different to that set of assumptions, so one just needs to be a bit thoughtful about it. Um, the key difference in aggregate, I'll come on to your question specifically, is clearly we are, I don't know, one and a half percentage points further up the curve than we were when we did the previous guidance, and therefore the next 100 basis points is very different to the 100 basis points that was the next one last time round. Um, factors that come into that are the, uh, the prime cap on the Hong Kong mortgages, et cetera, things we've talked about. Um, so that, that's why the numbers come down, but it is of a very different start point. The start point itself is higher, and therefore the, the increment is lower. Um, the mix between currencies, I guess, in part that is because some of the non-US dollar currencies have actually increased rates uh, later than the US dollar movements, and therefore we've got more of that still to come, and that is the largest part of why that block is moving less than some of the other blocks on that chart. So, operator, if there what, are, in, what are the largest, say, two or three currencies in there? There's, there's, a whole, there's a whole mixture. I think on the slide, we've split it out into uh, five different currency blocks, I think it is. Um, we've not sub-split the smaller one out there, but uh, um, you, you know the markets which we're in. You can see the, uh, um, the broad split of activity. So um, it's, a, it's quite a variety. So, operator, if, if there are no more calls online, do we have any, or on the phone, do we have any, any uh, questions online? Yes, we've got uh, three questions online. First one is from Manus Costello at Autonomous. You referenced the risks from a strong dollar and high inflation. Which of your markets most concern you with regards to these risks, and what are you doing to mitigate it? 
Uh, the, the, the best uh, mitigation, obviously, is prevention. And uh, we've, I think, done a, a, a quite a good job over the last years, uh, several years, of making sure that we don't have significant concentrations. I think we demonstrated that uh, in, the, in the real world with, uh, with the challenges in Sri Lanka, uh, where we absorbed the, the, the necessary provisions and increases in risk-weighted assets into what was nevertheless a very strong first quarter. Uh, as we look across the, 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 the characteristics of, of markets uh, that are under pressure, it, it, they tend to be uh, smaller and uh, more open economies that are uh, subject to the, uh, the, the economic impact of, of uh, higher U.S. dollar rates and a stronger U.S. dollar, so higher external debt balances. And uh, yeah, I think there's, if, if we refer back to some of the work that the IMF has done in terms of identifying some of the, of, of the hotspots, it's probably correlated with, uh, with some of our own concerns. Uh, the, uh, I think it, there's, there's, no, there's no good news, obviously, in, in, in periods of financial stress, uh, but uh, we do feel quite comfortable that we're prepared for the, the adverse outcomes in a number of markets that we face. We don't welcome any of them, uh, and we're, 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 we're very, we stay very close uh, to our central bank and sovereign clients. Uh, in many cases, we're the, we're the ratings advisor for these countries uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, ASEAN, uh, where, where, we, where we clearly are seeing some pressure. Uh, that leaves us in some position to, to help influence outcomes. Uh, it also certainly puts us in a very good position to understand what we can be doing, uh, both to, to help our, our clients and the, the, the communities in which we operate, but also to protect ourselves, uh, which is what we've been doing. So I won't get into much more detail uh, in terms of specific names, uh, but broadly, I think we're, we're as positioned uh, well, as well as we, as we can be. We see the stresses. We think it's going to be manageable. We think the IMF has been very proactive, and countries that have sought uh, IMF help relatively early on have navigated well so far. Uh, others that, that typically for, uh, for domestic political reasons, and Sri Lanka would be the, the most obvious case, that only brought the IMF in late uh, have fared less well. Uh, but we're optimistic on balance that we can work through this period of stress. But thanks for the question, Mattis. Thanks, Bill. Next question from Rob Noble at DB. There is a decline in market interest rates in 2024 in the US. Given this shape, should we expect NIM in 2024 below the 160 basis points average, or does the rate rise movement build through 2023? And the second part to the question, is 10% ROTI in 2024 possible with the expected dip in US rates? So 2024 is, is still some way out. Um, and I, I think, you know, high level, probably two sort of effects. One is if, as you say, the rates start to drop a little bit in that period, obviously that would be a bit lower. On the other hand, we do have a lot of our book that reprices beyond the first year. And therefore, there is a sort of undercurrent that actually flows through um, into subsequent years. So I, I'm not going to put a number on 2024. I know you didn't ask one, but I won't put one on there. But I don't think we should be seeing you know, a, a significant dip in that period, unless, obviously, US rates fundamentally change in the other direction. Um, consistent with that, I do think 2024 for the 10% ROTI is absolutely achievable. It is what we are setting our stall out to achieve. Um, the rates will be one part of how we get there. But let's not forget that the underlying growth with our customers is still good. And I think particularly for those that's based in the Western world where we read a lot of the press about the gloom and doom and the recession, you know, in the markets we are operating in, actually there is more positivity. Markets are coming out of COVID. You know, maybe there will be some um, undercurrent from recession over a period of time, but I suspect it may be a little bit later. Um, so overall, 2024 for the 10% ROTI, we feel very, very strongly about. Thank you, Andy. Uh, last question for the day from Guy Stebbings at Exain. It's interesting to hear that you're already seeing some signs of negative deposit mix shift into time deposits at this early stage in the rate cycle. Could you elaborate on what you've seen to date and what you assume within your NIM guidance for deposit mix shifts as we move further up the curve? I, 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 Andy will, uh, will take the question, but it's, it's, it's not surprising to us at all. It's exactly what we, what we expected. Uh, and the profile of the mix shift is it varies a bit from market to market, but it's broadly uh, exactly what we had factored into our uh, our 1.3 billion dollars of interest rate sensitivity guidance back in February. So, uh, so no big surprise. Uh, and I, I would underscore that that while of course free current accounts are, are preferable to to uh, time deposits where we pay some interest rates, uh, these are still attractive deposits for us. And 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 in aggregate, we're growing, uh, and that reflects as much as anything. 
the strong customer position that we've got, the underlying strength of our cash management business. It's coming both on the retail and the, and the corporate side. Uh, so we're not surprised by the evolution, and we're, we're happy with the progress of the underlying business. But Andy? No, I mean, to repeat what I said earlier, we are seeing a small movement to time deposits, I think, to maybe 3% actually um, so far in the year to date. Um, I'd expect that we would see another few percentage points over the balance of the year because obviously rates still rising. Um, but as I say, for us overall, there's a balance here. Um, you know, it, it may be marginally more expensive, not a lot more, but actually it's sticky, it's good quality, it stays there from a regulatory treatment, it's, it's very, very good funding for us. So yes, a little bit of mixed change, not a worry, uh, factored into the NIM thinking and factored into NIM thinking indeed for next year as well. Good. So we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here. I'd like to offer huge thanks to all of you for taking uh, the time on a sunny Friday morning in London, if that's where you happen to be, uh, in what we know is a very busy day for all of you, uh, ahead of what I hope will be a relaxing weekend. And uh, for those getting a break, a, a really nice, uh, nice bit of break over the summer. But thanks again, and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.